A very good morning to everyone. Let us take some moments of silence and meditation to prepare ourselves for the service. The Call to Worship Oh, give thanks to God who calls us here. Come, sing of God's glorious deeds. Come, listen for God's wisdom that speaks to us now. Listen up for inspiration and truth. Oh, worship our God who is holy and just with honour and all praise. Let us join Bernard now for the song, Bless the Lord. The psalmist says, the Lord has established His throne in the heavens and His kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, all you His angels, you mighty ones who does His work, obeying the voice of the Lord. Amen. Let's together with the angels. Bless the Lord, all our soul. And all who gather in the holy place, bless the Lord. All who call upon the God who saves, bless the Lord. If your sins have been washed
Let us join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we bless you when we think of your great love. And Father, we want to just acknowledge how you love us like no other. God, when we want to make all the rules so that we can win every game, you lovingly call us to your side and put your arm around us and whisper, play fair. When we tremble in fear, worried that our lives are about to crash to the bottom, you say the words to us, be still, and you hold us in the hollow of your hand. When we follow those who pretend to save us to achieve their own ends, you remind us that we have been chosen to be examples of faith to others. When we will fill our pockets with the treasures of temptation, you ask us to empty them so we can become servants of hope. God in community, we want to pray and seek your forgiveness, knowing all too easily we slip off the path to your kingdom despite our sincere efforts to live according to your ways. We want to ask that, Lord, you will answer our prayers because you have promised to forgive us when we confess our sins to you. And so, Lord, enable us to receive your forgiveness. Enable us to stop putting you to the test so that we can open our hypocritical hearts to your healing touch. We pray that we may be able to give ourselves to you confidently, completely and faithfully. As we gather before you, we remember the church planning that is coming up next week. We know that many leaders and their subcommittees have been meeting and we pray that, Lord, you will align our hearts that we will give ourselves objective evaluations of the th things that we have done this year, that we may move forward into the next year with greater wisdom from hindsight, with greater conviction about the things we ought to do. We pray for our pastoral supply in this year's annual conference and pray that, Lord, you will send to us the pastors for the hour, that, God, they may be able to serve you and indeed Lord, bring the congregation one step closer to you. We pray for brothers and sisters who are taking their year-end or their GCEO and A-levels. We pray that, Lord, in your mercy, you will stay close to these these ones, they need your affirmation. They need the confidence that you are never far away. And they need the confidence that you journey with them through these tough times. So Lord, come around them. We pray for the sick and the infirmed, that Lord, by your grace, they may be helped and healed. That they will find that steadfast hope comes from depending on you. So Lord, let our hearts and minds be alert as we prepare ourselves to hear your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is taken from Matthew 5, verses 21 to 24. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar 
and there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Today, our speaker is Mrs. Lai King Puson, and she serves with Love Singapore and is passionate about Singapore prayer, revival, personal and national destiny. She is married to Dr. Edward Puson, and um, they have three children, Jachin, Justice and Evangeline. Let us welcome her today. Good morning, Church. The scripture this morning is Matthew 5, 21 to 24. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Verse 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this morning is yours. We submit ourselves to you. We ask, Lord, you tune our ears and our hearts to hear your voice. Your word says, today, if you hear the Lord speaking, do not harden your hearts. Therefore, Lord, help us to listen intensely, intentionally. And Lord, as you speak, oh God, cause us to respond rightly. Lord, I submit myself to you. Let the words of my mouth, meditations of our hearts together to be completely acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of my sermon is Go Make Things Right. Go Make Things Right. God is relational. God is a relational God. The Creator seeks relationship with his creation, fallen humanity. And that is why he sends Jesus to reconcile sinful men to himself. The greatest commandment is relational. It's all about relationships. Luke 10, 27 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We see here vertical relationship with God. We see here horizontal relationship with our fellow human beings. God is saying, love God by loving your neighbor as yourself. Relationships matter. Our horizontal relationships matter. Our human relationships matter. The quality of our human relationships is a very big deal to God. Is it close-knit and comforting? Is it merely civil and ceremonial? Or is it just cordial and contractual? <laughs> or is it cold and conflicted? We know our relationships well. Relationships matter to God because He is relational how we relate, how we treat one another. Not too long ago, a thought leader on social or societal transformation was in town. A few of us were invited to tea with him. Well, without mincing words, he told us this, Singapore is materially rich, but relationally poor. Ouch. Some got really upset and thought to the guy, hey, first time we are meeting you and you are so rude. Others felt the sting of truth and sought his counsel, what shall we do? What shall we do? He said, hey, you cannot be so career driven and so economically driven that you neglect the most important thing in life. The most important thing that makes life meaningful, relationships. Healthy relationships, rich and real. 
Doesn't mean perfect, but it is rich and real. Nobody is pretending, but everybody tries their best to keep relationships healthy. When we are relationally poor, the chances of miscommunication, misunderstanding, irritation, frustration, and offense are greater. And that's where the chances of holding grudges are also greater when we are relationally poor. Every little irritation woo, can become World War number 3. Let's read Matthew 5, 23 to 24 again, this time in the message version. All right, the message version. He sa it says, if you enter your place of worship and you're about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, abandon your offering. Leave immediately. Go to this friend and make things right. Go make things right. Then and only then come back and work things out with God. First of all, first and foremost, go make right. Make things right. So what exactly is a grudge? Well, being occasionally irritated by someone you know, maybe someone's uncalled for remarks, you know, or misbehavior is quite normal. Being occasionally irritated is almost an everyday thing for most people, unfortunately. The triggers are everywhere. Anywhere we find human beings, there would be some irritation of one kind or the other. Be it at home, in the office, at school, at the mall, <laughs> wow along the street, in the bus, in a taxi, whatever, where there are human beings, the potential for irritations would always be there. But holding a grudge is more than occasional irritation. Holding a grudge is devastatingly much more than that. So what is a grudge? Simply this, a bad feeling or hatred you hold against another person for something bad they did to you or maybe you thought they did to you. Another dictionary source defines it this way, a persistent feeling of ill will or anger or deep-seated resentment resulting from a past insult or injury. Persistent feeling of ill will or anger or deep-seated resentment because of a past insult or injury. The resentment can be deep, often to the point of contempt. The anger can be strong, sometimes to the point of revenge. One counselor likened it to a bed of toxic waste we drag around wherever we go. Wow. These toxic emotions of resentment and anger can last for a long time, and for some people, for a lifetime. No good. Ephesians 4.26 says, Do not let the sun set upon your anger. Your grudges. But for some of us, we are still holding the grudge. We are still simmering in resentment and anger many sunsets later. Not wise. Jesus says, No good. Go make things right. Go make things right. Human relationships matter. Grudges are not worth keeping. Tell the friend next to you, <laughs> see where you are, wherever you are in your home. Tell one another, grudges are not worth keeping. I have three reasons for that. Number one, reason number one, because holding grudges displeases God. Matthew 5 verses 23 and 24 imply that holding a grudge makes our worship unacceptable to God. Which means holding grudges is unacceptable. It applies both ways. Whether it is the person holding a grudge against you or you holding a grudge against another person, it applies to both the offender and the offended. You know, we are familiar with the Lord's Prayer, especially the, 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 the particular line in Matthew 6, 12 that says, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Methodist churches, the Lord's Prayer. Every Sunday we pray that, isn't it so? But the more accurate translation goes this way. Forgive us our sins as we have, have forgiven those who sin against us. As we have forgiven those who sin against us. But the trouble is, have we really forgiven? Our Father in heaven expects us to forgive. Two verses down, in the same breath, Jesus reinforced our Father's expectation with a warning. He says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. I think this is very serious. None of us would want our Heavenly Father not to forgive our sins. Therefore, we had better obey. It's strange, it is sad that we do not take this gospel truth more seriously. Beware. To hold a grudge is to withhold from clear gospel truth. To hold a grudge is to withhold forgiveness. To withhold forgiveness is to contradict God. And to withhold forgiveness is to make a mockery of the cross. Oh Lord, soften our hearts. Go and make things right. Grudges are not worth keeping. Reason number two, because holding grudges devastates us. Not only does it displease God and makes our worship unacceptable, but holding grudges devastates us. Research shows that regardless of age, holding grudges impacts a person's physical and mental health negatively. It raises blood pressure, it depletes immune function, it deepens depression, it exerts enormous physical pressure, stress on the body, and it can result in back pain, stomach problems, headaches, and so much more. Wow. Of course, not all sicknesses are the result of holding grudges. Take the story of Job, for example. Job's case, were, Job was 100% innocent. His health crisis was a case of satanic attack permitted by God. But that aside, it is worth noting that medically, Unforgiveness, holding grudges, unforgiveness is classified as a disease. You can go Google, Google search. Counselors, psychiatrists say that as soon as a person begins to forgive, healing begins. And the opposite is true when the person refuses to forgive. Wow. Even the medical world has begun to acknowledge that unforgiveness is a life-threatening disease. Early on in my ministry experience, I did a three-month stint as a volunteer at, the, at a mental hospital in California, Palmdale, California. It was a divine setup. I was just a 20-something-year-old person, my first ministry training that led on to that. My Heavenly Father wanted me <laughs> to feel His heart for broken humanity and to open my eyes to see the danger and destructive power of unforgiveness, of holding grudges. I got to know a patient. I'll call her Susie. Susie looked like Julie Andrews. Wow, from head to toe. <laughs> her hair, her eyes, her nose, even her height. Once upon a time, Susie was a New York Philharmonic pianist. Her life was wrecked, how? By deep-seated resentment and anger she had harbored against a guy because of a broken relationship, failed romance. Susie's toxic emotions resulted in many meltdowns which landed her in that mental hospital. It was painful for me to watch Susie one moment, she would be happy as a lark. Wow. She would be dancing her way into the social hall, you know, doing, and then come to the piano and doing her magic on the piano, singing, the hills are alive with the sound of music. Awesome. But the next moment, she would be looking around, you know, and then she would be throwing her fits in uncontrollable rage. Honestly, 
I was terrified. I was a 20-something year old newbie in ministry. I was shaken. I was awakened. I witnessed the demons of resentment and unforgiveness bring devastation to a young life that once brimmed with promise. Well, come to find out, 80% of the cases at that mental hospital were related to unforgiveness. It struck me like a ton of bricks. So watch out, family. Watch out, church. Grudges are not worth keeping. Not worth it. First, do yourself a favor. Forgive. Go make things right. Grudges are not worth keeping. Reason number three. Because holding grudges destroy community. Displeases God, makes our worship unacceptable, it devastates our lives, and number three, it destroys community. It diminishes our witness as a result. There was a situation here in Singapore in a local church where the leadership was in, uh, I would say, total disarray. And it wasn't over theology, it was a case of personality clash. Why? Because of hotheads, <laughs> wounded pride, and selfish ambition. Watch out. Short tempers and long grudges are the perfect ingredients for a public showdown. Dangerous. And so it happened one Sunday morning, an embittered elder stood up, picked up a chair, and flung it at the guy he, held, he had a grudge against. Who else but the senior pastor at the pulpit? When I heard about that, I was deeply grieved. I was troubled. Whatever happened to Christian love, I thought. What happened, whatever happened to self-control, the fruit of the Spirit? Whatever happened to leaders leading by example? How are the believers taking all this drama? How are they coping with all this public display of ugliness? Will there be repentance and reconciliation? Worst of all, my heart shuddered. Were there pre-believers present? At that Sunday morning, what a shame. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another by this your love for one another, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What happened in that church was obviously not love for one another. Wake up, church. Satan's biggest ambition is to incite anger, breed resentment, divide the church family, split relationships, destroy community, and thereby diminish our witness. He knows how precious the church is to the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord gave his life for the church. And he, the devil is all out to destroy the Jesus community from within. One unforgiving relationship at a time. Today we can choose to be different. We can choose to turn the page we can choose to go make things right, forgive and reconcile. Grudges are not worth keeping. Grudges displease God. Grudges devastate us. Grudges destroy community. Go and make things right. As disciples, we must always choose to go and make things right. How? Forgive and reconcile. Reconciliation is a big theme in the Bible. God gave his son to reconcile men to himself. Forgive and reconcile. Why reconcile? Because reconciliation is Christ-like. Reconciliation is Christ-like. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Same way, <laughs> when we reconcile with somebody who had offended us, we no longer count their sin against them. 
Look back to the cross while dying in excruciating pain. Jesus did not resent his crucifiers. Instead, he loved them as the Father loved them. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And Jesus was that willing son. In fact, Jesus prayed for his crucifiers. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Reconciliation is Christ-like. Love keeps no record of being wronged. Love one another by this the world will know. C.S. Lewis said, to be a Christian is to be Christ-like. And it means this, to forgive the inexcusable in others because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Forgive the inexcusable in others because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Reconciliation is Christ-like. True discipleship that stands the test of time is marked by a spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation. Jesus is the perfect example. He set the example and, and he invites us to follow his example. Go and make things right. Reconciliation is the mark of true discipleship. Why? Because reconciliation is a command. Jesus' command to be obeyed. Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. A few verses I like to read, and I want you to follow it very carefully. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Hallelujah, yeah? Verse 16. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Don't give up. If he at first doesn't listen, bring two or three others, make reconciliation, do your best, make, put in your best efforts. Verse 17, if he refuses to listen to even these two or three other witnesses, tell, then tell it to the church and leave the matter there. Jesus gives this three-step plan for reconciliation. How to make things right. Go make things right. And it applies to both the offender and the offended. First, go privately, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. Don't wash dirty linen in public. Don't post on social media. Number two. Second, if he does not listen, then bring two or three others, trusted friends, confidants, and have a conversation together. And if he still doesn't listen, then tell it to the church and leave it there. Let the pastors handle that. Reconciliation is the mark of true disciples of Jesus Christ. Why? Because reconciliation is our ministry. It's our ministry. Not only is reconciliation Christ-like, it is also a command. Number three, Reconciliation is our ministry. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 to 20, so clear. It says, God, through Christ, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Wow. It's a great ministry. Reconciliation, And it's a great message. And God has entrusted this ministry of reconciliation and this message of reconciliation to us. What an awesome privilege to represent Jesus as ambassadors of reconciliation. How can we therefore tolerate unresolved conflicts and broken relationships within the church family, among God's people, God help us. How can we allow wounds to remain unhealed? Isn't that such a mockery of Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross? May God forgive us. In honor of Jesus, choose reconciliation. Go and make things right with one another. Ultimately, reconciliation is a choice. Think about the biological family, family and home, your own natural family. Family is God's idea. 
He instituted the family as the basic building block of society. No wonder the enemy is working so hard to undermine the family. Do you know, in Singapore, dysfunctional families are becoming more common. Broken marriages are on the increase. Family. This little unit, this microcosm of precious relationships is the very place where relationships can break down so easily and the devil is hard at work, irritating us and causing us to bear grudges. So much hurt or so much healing can happen all within a 24-hour day. And it's all by choice. We can choose to stay hurt and bear the grudge, or we can choose to forgive and reconcile and be healed within the biological family. Now think about the larger church family. Of course, you know, <laughs> we are people from different, uh, wow, well, uh, sectors of society, yeah? Different, so many different personalities. If there are 300 members in the church, there could be 300 different personalities, with different ambitions and ideas. Issues may not be settled, but relationships can be repaired. We must major on the major, right relationships. We can choose to love again, even though we do not see eye to eye on some matters. We can choose to agree to disagree lovingly and respectfully whether it is at the cell level or whether it is at the board level, the LCEC, any number where, of, of, of arrangements where human interactions happen. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. True disciples of Jesus who love Jesus will always choose to be peacemakers. Here's a prophetic word, a warning that I, I experienced. And it was so real that uh, when I was preparing the message, I really felt that I should include the story. I was praying for senior church leadership in Singapore. And God had very supernaturally impressed upon my mind 61 names. Now, at that time, you know, I, I don't know most of them. I know them by name. I know that they, they, uh, they are pastor here, pastor there. But I don't know them in person, most of them, all right? I said, God, how on earth am I going to pray for these 61 names? Immediately, it was very clear. Isaiah 61. Use that as your standard prayer script to bless each one. Wow. I said, okay, Isaiah 61. So I read up Isaiah It's a powerful portion of Scripture. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news, da, 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 all those fantastic, all 11 verses. I was very moved. So every day I would pray for all the 61 names. I announce all of their names one by one, one by one, and then I pray Isaiah 61, different portions of scripture, different days. One morning I came to name number 11. Name number 11. I won't mention who, all right? I heard myself pray something radically different. Everything to do with relational conflicts and wounds. I was quite stunned. Then I had a vision. I saw this man seated on the ground in a very barren landscape. He was sick and languishing. From head to toe, he was covered with big, festering wounds, open wounds, festering wounds. Then I spotted two vultures circling in the sky right above him. Two vultures circling in the sky right above this wounded man. I immediately understood what the Lord was trying to say to me. Vouchers feed on dead bodies. Vouchers seldom ever attack healthy animals. Vouchers will kill the wounded or the sick. That's why we see vast numbers of vouchers in the war zones. This man, languishing with open wounds, it looked like, He's going to perish. He's going to die any time. Ready feed for the vouchers. Here's the warning from the Lord. The vouchers represent evil. The devil is spying. He prowls around looking for someone to devour. He's waiting to swoop down 
on his wounded, dying prey. Wake up, church. Whether it is relational conflict between husband and wife, between parents and children, pastor and pastor, leader and leader, pastor and leader, pastor and members, member and member, employer and employee, friend and friend, neighbor and neighbor, government and citizens, go make things right. Grudges are not worth keeping. Don't let the wounds fester. Don't fall trapped into the devil's lies. Release forgiveness. Choose reconciliation. Reconciliation is the right to do, is, is the right thing to do. Relinquish the rights to get even. Respond to bad with good. Openly confess the truth before God and before others who are involved. What exactly happened? Tell the story. State the truth. What is your part of the problem? What is your guilt? Take responsibility for your part in the relationship problem. Pour out your heart before God in repentance. Pray with one another. Seek forgiveness from the other party. Reconcile. Restore the broken relationship. Love again. Choose to trust again. God is relational. He created us for community. He created us to be relational. Let me close with a story. And this is a real story. This is not a dream, it is not a vision, but this is something I experienced, just like in the mental hospital. A lady ministry staff from a Pentecostal church wanted a mentoring relationship with me. Wow, I felt honored. Well, I was open to the idea, but because I don't know her well at all, I felt the need to get to know her better before I say yes. So we met. Something came up unexpectedly, all right, in that first meeting, in that first conversation. Oh, she told me rather casually about this big grudge she had against her father. Ouch. And it was over some silly disagreements, and for two years, she avoided her father. How she did that, I could not imagine. Why? Because she lived under the same roof with her father and siblings. For two years, she refused to speak to her father. They lived in the same house, and this father is a pre-believer. Everyone in that household, the majority being pre-believers, knew. Now, this is a full-time ministry pastor, all right? I was deeply troubled. I thought, this is so wrong, so, so wrong. And I told my friend in that very first meeting that it's absurd to talk about ministry and mentoring unless she takes steps to forgive, reconcile, and end her cold war with her pre-believer father. I said, the cold war is unchristian, unscriptural. The Cold War diminishes her standing as a disciple and her standing as a full-time minister. It tarnishes the name of Jesus. It wrecks the witness of, our, of the church. The Cold War must end. Of course, my friend was very startled by my forthrightness. I was also. She accepted the fact that my counsel was biblical, scriptural, and she promised to do something about it. We prayed. Eventually, by the grace of God, she did. She ate humble pie, and she made things right. Go and make things right. The eyes thawed. The walls came tumbling down. The stones were removed. The bridge was restored. And within a year, hallelujah, the father gave his life to Jesus. Shortly after that, the father was called home to be with the Lord. I was very moved. Church, wake up. A wise church, 
forgives and reconciles. Think about your web of relationships. If you hear the Lord speaking to you today, do not harden your heart. You suddenly remember who is holding a grudge against you or you're holding a grudge against somebody else. Go make things right. Within the day, within the week, forgive and reconcile. The choice is ours. Life or death. Think about the voucher. The choice is yours. The choice is mine. Our choice today defines our future. Our choices today define the kind of society future generations will inherit. Will it be a toxic environment of ill will and resentment and ill feelings and anger? Or will it be a healing environment of forgiveness and love and reconciliation? Remember, grudges are not worth keeping. Reconciliation is the right thing to do. Reconciliation is the spirit of Christ. Reconciliation is the culture of the kingdom. Reconciliation honors Jesus Christ because he's the biggest, the greatest reconciler in world history. Reconciliation is Christ-like. Reconciliation is a command. Reconciliation is our message and our ministry. Reconciliation is spelled God and God is love. The greatest of this is love. Go and make things right. I want you to spend the rest of today reflecting on your web of relationships. Begin with your little circle called family, then your relatives, and let, it, let, let, let the circle enlarge. And allow the Lord to speak to you. He may lead you to drop a WhatsApp message to a friend and say, please forgive me, I've been holding this grudge against you or to a, a, a daughter or son who has been overseas for a while and you guys have not been on talking terms. Take action. Do the right thing. Go and make things right. That's just the beginning. That little WhatsApp message is just the beginning. And then from there on, you continually seek to make things right and make efforts to love again, to build trust and restore the relationship. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, as your word had gone forth, I cry out to you in your great grace and mercy, unite our hearts to fear your name. Unite our hearts, O oh Lord. O oh God, stir that will and that zeal, Father, to, to obey you. Your word is truth. Therefore, help us to love truth and live the truth, obey the truth, so that there will be healing healing and reconciliation in all of our relationships so that your church, oh God, oh truly will exhibit true love. Lord, pre-believers watching us will be impressed and will be attracted to the kind of love that we have for one another because we obeyed your command. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Help everyone to willingly, willingly submit to the truth of your word. And yes, indeed, go the extra mile to make things right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Upward I 
We'd like to thank Mrs. Liking Pusson for her sharing this morning. And before we take the offering, let us pray together. Let us pray. You do not choose favourites, Holy God, but pour out your blessings on all your children, trusting that we will empty our hearts, our lives, our treasure in meeting the needs of those around us. And yet today there is a specific word that before we bring our gift before the altar, you call us to be reconciled to our brother before we bring this gift to you. Enable us to obey you, bless these gifts and use them to bring healing and hope to your people. Amen. Now you may give to the Lord. You can choose whichever way works better for you. I will give you some time. Welcome to YMM this morning, brothers and sisters. Do continue to share our worship broadcast link with your neighbours and friends. Our Chinese worship is at 9 and our English one is at 10. Pray for us as we work out the worship arrangements in phase 3 and we will appreciate all of your prayers. Just to update, Last week, for TTC, we collected an amount, $1,053. Thank you all for your generous gift. In our website, we have placed many options for you to use for devotionals and uh, for beneficial daily time with the Lord. So let's not give up but persevere to go to the website and find the devotion that meets your needs. Also, the memory verse has been uh, now a new uh, 
exercise in our church and we are going to memorize one verse every month. So do go to the website and download the verse of the month which is taken from John chapter 14 verse 27. The baptism and membership classes will start soon. Those of you who have not been baptized, we want to dare you to be baptized and identified with the people of God. Pray and seek the Lord that he may work a miracle in your home and your life. It is a day class at 4 p.m. on Saturdays. And this coming Friday, we will have our push meeting of the month. Do join us and we will send out the link uh, that you can come along. There is a training to equip uh, brothers and sisters, especially those who uh, wish to visit with the pastor or want to visit with Pastor Tim, or you may come along on this uh, day that uh, we have set aside for this visitation training. So I have actually uh, fitted a second session on Saturday afternoon, just in case I do not finish uh, on the Friday night. Uh, so please take note and register, come along. There is this YA workshop and who do you see in this PowerPoint? Yes, our Reverend Simon. Our Reverend Simon is going to conduct a BGR session for young couples. And so do spread the word that they can come along and ask him anything that they need to know so that they can grow in their relationship in a godly manner. On the CAC 4th Annual Day of Prayer on the 31st of October, you are all invited to participate. It is co-organised by the Board of Laity and the Board of Senior Ministry. It is in the morning between 10 and 11.30, so you can email and use this link to register. Next week, we will be having Bishop Emeritus Robert Solomon to share with us uh, and the message entitled A Message for a New Generation, taken from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 to 19. And let us all come together, prepare our hearts to sing this last song together with Bernard.
know that God desires our repentance and acts of reconciliation more than our gifts on His altar. Go, make things right. The blessings of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Thank you all for joining us uh, on this Sunday worship. We hope to see you again next week at the same channel.